Welcome everyone. My name is Rhonda Dearborn. I'm the senior editor for Springer Publishing Company. I work with our counseling and, and uh, family therapy authors on their titles. And today we are very lucky to have Dr. Stephanie Bueller join us to talk about five keys to being a sex positive provider, embracing consensual expressions of sexuality. We want to thank all of you today for joining. We know that this time of year can be extremely hectic, and we really are grateful that you could spend a little bit of time with us today and join us in this webinar. Uh, I wanted to just speak to a couple of points before I introduce our speaker, Dr. Bueller. Uh, I wanted to let you know that this session is being recorded. It will be disseminated out. So if you have colleagues who were not able to join us live, we will be sending out a recording of this uh, event uh, probably in about a week to 10 days via email. In addition, uh, Dr. Bueller has consented to share her PowerPoint presentation as well. So the recording of this event along with the deck will be disseminated out via email. Also, everyone is muted today, all the participants, so everyone who's here attending is muted, but we will be taking questions. So if you do have any questions during the presentation, please post them in the Q&A box that you see on the bottom of your screen. We'll be keeping track of questions, and uh, one of my colleagues, Lee Montville will be posing those questions to Dr. Bueller at the conclusion on your behalf. So uh, with that said, again, if some folks have just joined, my name is Rhonda Dearborn. I'm the senior editor here for counseling and, and uh, family therapies, school psychology. And I'm going to now introduce our speaker of the day, Dr. Stephanie Bueller. Uh, she is a licensed psychologist and ASEX certified sex therapist and supervisor. She is director of the Bueller Institute and creator of the LearnSexTherapy.com site, which provides continuing education in sex and relationship therapy for psychotherapists and wellness providers. Dr. Bueller specializes in working with sexually, uh, sexuality, chronic illness and cancer, sexual pain disorders, and sexuality and mental health. She has worked in several medical settings, including an integrated wellness uh, center, Radies Children's Hospital, and as a sex therapist at a major regional hospital. Currently, her clinical work focuses on training providers who want to practice sex therapy and sexuality counseling. Dr. Bueller is the author of several books, including a best-selling textbook, What Every Mental Health Professional Needs to Know About Sex, which just came out in a third edition and published by Springer Publishing Company. Dr. Bueller has spoken to professional audiences all over the country and around the globe and is frequently quoted in the media, most recently in The Atlantic, Men's Health, and Business Insider. And with that, I'm going to turn over this presentation to our speaker, Stephanie Bueller. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rhonda, for that introduction. I really appreciated it. And thank you also to you and to everyone at Springer for agreeing to publish a third edition of What Every Mental Health Professional Needs to Know About Sex. And today I'm going to be talking about five keys to becoming a sex positive provider. I'll be speaking about uh, the term, what it means to be sex positive, how to become sex positive, and we'll sum it up with some takeaways. So what is sex positivity? Uh, it, it, this is a, it's not that new a term. It's come about maybe in the last few years. It's, but it's, it's a term that's being thrown around a lot. And I really want to uh, give some definition to it and round it out. What does it mean exactly? Uh, the first thing is seeing sex as a positive aspect of a person's existence across the lifespan. So from birth until death, we are sexual beings. And even though our sexuality changes, our relationships may change, we remain sexual beings. And we have to kind of expand our ideas of what it means to be sexual too, of get away from the 
uh, what somebody has called the hegemony of penis vagina intercourse and uh, think about it as affection, as um, uh, attachment, as experiencing different things and so on and so forth. Um, the next uh, concept, if you will, is embracing the idea that every aspect of sexual expression is acceptable if it's consensual. Of course, we want all sexual activity to be consensual. We don't want coercion. We don't want any uh, sexual violence, certainly, uh, that, that follows safer sex guidelines and that it does not create distress. And that means it does not create distress for the person. Somebody else might not really enjoy a certain sexual practice or uh, doesn't uh, care for the idea of being in a non-monogamous relationship. But if the person in your office is cool with it, not creating distress, it's fine. That is sex positivity also. It also means being inclusive of sexual and gender minorities and black, indigenous and people of color and recognizing the impact of the intersectionality of identity. <clears throat> now, intersectionality is another term that is getting used a lot, has a specific meaning. It comes from uh, Crawford uh, several years ago. And what she talked about is the idea that if you are a sexual and gender minority, and you are also BIPOC, for example, that you have a kind of, a, a, kind of an exponential amount of stress. In other words, it's stressful to be a sexual and gender minority, but add an ethnic difference to that as well. And now you've got some additional stress. We want to be inclusive so that we uh, minimize the amount of stress that people feel, especially when they're coming into the office of a provider. We want to make them feel welcome. And I'll talk more about that in a little bit. We also want to understand the expansive range of sexual and romantic relationships, including asexual relationships and consensual non-monogamy. And somebody might be scratching their head and saying asexual relationships. Well, there was an article in the New York Times uh, a couple of months ago, and it talked about uh, people who were marrying someone in their lives that they had a romantic or even a friendship connection with, uh, and they, they couldn't see themselves being without this person. So, you know, and, and not causing me any distress, not causing them any distress. Let's be sex positive and embrace all kinds of relationships and all kinds of sexual expression even non-sexual expression in the case of somebody who is asexual, for example. So what is sex negativity? It's, it's viewing sex as something shameful or dangerous that needs to be controlled by an outside authority. And certainly we can come up with many examples, even very recent examples of uh, patriarchal or we could say matriarchal uh, laws that are trying to control how people behave in terms of their sexuality or their relationships. It also means condoning a binary outlook on gender orientation and relationships. So thinking of uh, people being either cisgender or transgender, gay or straight, monogamous or single. We know that uh, in terms of gender and orientation, for example, and I talk about this a little bit in my book, uh, this idea comes from um, uh, Stephen Braveman, who uh, taught me that, uh, you know, to think about a galaxy of gender and orientation and that people can be any place on the galaxy. And by the way, the galaxy is also moving so people can be fluid as well. And we really need to get away from that idea that there's just one, you're one or the other. Uh, and that causes a lot of confusion for people. So trust me, it's a very important concept so that you can sit with someone who's confused or questioning or, or someone who comes in and, and identifies themselves as queer. And that's all of that is, is fine. Um, we also want to guard against discriminating against sexual and gender minorities, uh, BIPOC people based on their identity, uh, even in small covert ways with uh, microaggressions or um, the, the language that we use on our intake forms and so on. I'll talk again, talk about that in a little bit. 
Uh, and also we want to avoid pathologizing sexual behaviors, attitudes, and beliefs that do not conform with some imagined norm. I know sometimes I, I give talks and I'm being sex positive and somebody will ask, well, doesn't that mean that the person ha- you know, is going to have terrible problems with their relationships? Not necessarily. You know, somebody can find uh, another person who shares their sexual interests and they have a great time together. Where is the problem? So we have to be really careful about pathologizing people's sexual behaviors, for example. So there, here are the keys. Making up, number one, making up for deficits in sex education. Number two, becoming familiar with the current sexual climate. Number three, creating an affirming practice. Four, examining one's own biases. And finally, number five, becoming a role model for others regarding sexuality. So number one, making up for a deficit in sex education. I very much doubt that anyone listening to this webinar can say, I had a wonderful education regarding sexuality. I mean, after all, think about it. When, uh, for example, we're shown the female reproductive anatomy and, you know, we see the the ovaries, the fallopian tubes, and the and the uterus, but we don't really see the vaginal canal. And goodness gracious, forget about showing the clitoris or anything about external uh, external anatomy, which is why I think everybody is calling a, a, a their vulva a vagina. I mean, the, the vulva is on the outside, the vagina is on the inside. So we know that there's inadequate sex education. Uh, and if you don't know your own anatomy, that means that you can't uh, do adequate self-care. You know, you can't talk to uh, your physician about what's going on, perhaps, or it makes it hard to talk to uh, a partner about your own sexual anatomy. So that's really important. Um, You also want to identify areas where you may be lacking in knowledge. You know, look, I've written this book. (laughs) It's it's every, what every mental health professional needs to know about sex. It is not everything that there is to know about sex. So there's so much to know. I'm always learning and I hope that you get excited about this wonderful topic and you are always learning as well. Uh, You should seek out information from credible resources. That can be a little tricky. I mean, you go on uh, Google, for example, and you get all kinds of strange ideas, say about um, uh, uh, how to cope with erectile dysfunction or something like that. You really need to find credible resources. For example, sometimes I've sent clients to read up about certain things. Uh, Mayo Clinic, for example, has a really great, great site with all kinds of information about all kinds of things. So that, that would be one place with uh, credible information or even WebMD, uh, ISWISH, all kinds of uh, Uh, websites have great information. Uh, And also you want to develop resources for educating clients about their sexuality. It's one of the reasons that the book, if you purchase the book, you get access to 60 pages of uh, client handouts on all kinds of topics. So that is a real, I mean, it's a great bonus. Um, I know that I've used those uh, handouts with my own clients quite frequently. Key number two is understanding the current sexual climate. Well, everybody needs to understand sexuality. Even if you don't call yourself a sex therapist per se, you are a mainstream therapist or you have a different specialty, you need to know about sexuality because it's a a topic of great importance to many people. Uh, uh, For example, one example is that Uh, many adults are living longer with chronic illnesses and cancer. And those chronic illnesses and cancer can cause sexual effects. Even if you're not a sex therapist, you may have somebody in your practice who has had breast cancer, prostate cancer. Don't assume that say their physician has spoken to them about sexuality. You want to be able to talk to them about those things. So that's just one example of a change. Another is that one in five Americans has engaged in some form of consensual non-monogamy. That can be anything from a threesome to a full polyamorous open uh, relationship. 
Um, and that's a lot of people. I mean, that's 20% of Americans has engaged in that. You need to know something about that. You don't fall. I, I actually, I wrote an article for the camp magazine called Don't Fall Off Your Chair. Uh, and it's about consensual non-monogamy. Um, the other thing is that more people are identifying as a sexual or gender minority. Uh, so we know, for example, there are more uh, teens, young people who are coming out as transgender or gender non-binary, gender fluid, gay, straight, queer, uh, you know, any per permutation thereof, which is a, a great thing. However, they're coming out in a world that isn't quite so open and it creates a clash for them. So that's something to be aware of. Uh, the last thing, uh, just an example of changes in the current sexual climate. Half the participants in one Canadian survey expressed having ha uh, engaged in at least one paraphilic activity. So I think maybe the most, the most well-known paraphilic activity is BDSM because we had the 50 shades of gray, but there are other kinds of activities, other kinds of kink. Uh, and so, you know, it's a very, it's very common. Uh, it's not rare at all. And, you know, I think, I think if you're uh, in this webinar, you're the kind of person who wants to think of themselves as being sex positive and that people can talk to you about their kinks without you getting um, upset or, you know, microaggression, you know, wrinkling your nose or whatever it is that you want to be open to what is going on in the current sexual climate. I will say this, something that I learned in uh, writing even the first edition of the book, uh, therapists tend to be socially liberal, but personally more conservative than their clients. And we want to keep up with where our clients are at. Okay. And so going on to key number three, uh, creating an affirming practice. Uh, this is so important. Um, you, you can't just be an ally. You need to be, uh, you know, an ally is someone you know, a therapist who says, and I've heard things like this, oh, you know, I watched every episode of Will and Grace. Uh, that does not make you that, you know, that's wonderful, but it doesn't make you an ally in terms of having a deeper understanding of the kinds of issues that uh, sexual and gender minority, that is LGBTQIA plus people uh, may face. And, um, you know, we know, for example, sexual and gender minorities are at increased risk of mental as well as physical health problems. So we want to understand the effects of minority stress, also discrimination in the healthcare system, and, uh, you know, people not not getting uh, their needs met uh, because they're afraid to talk about their sexuality with their physician or nurse practitioner. Um, and I've already talked about intersectionality uh, and, and risks that come along with that. Um, you want to eliminate stigma and discrimination in your practice. Uh, there are um, ways of doing that. We know, for example, that uh, BIPOC and sexual gender minority people appreciate uh, seeing images uh, that they can relate to on your website, for example, or in your office, uh, and that their, you know, their um, identities are acknowledged on your intake forms, for example. Um, you also want to reflect on heterosexism and cisgenderism, that you can't make assumptions. One example from my book was you know, uh, having, uh, say, sexual counseling materials or just counseling materials that are geared towards gay men or geared towards lesbian women because their uh, dynamics are different than heterosexual dynamics. For example, gay men to be, tend to be more democratic. Heterosexual couples tend to be, you know, there's more of a power differential there, male-female power differential to be aware of. That doesn't mean that there aren't power differentials in other kinds of relationships. It's just kind of an example. And, you know, the, the one thing, one term that I like that I'm hearing a lot these days is monolith that, you know, so nothing, nothing is a monolith. So, uh, you know, we have to be careful in the way that we um, uh, uh, 
think about certain populations and realize that there are individuals within those populations that are uh, different in one way or another, that there's always a spectrum of identities, of behaviors, of attitudes and beliefs and so on. You also want to understand, again, that there are many avenues to being out or to expressing one's sexuality. So the, for example, um, I know here in uh, where I am, I'm in Orange County, California, and a quarter of the population here is Asian. And uh, we know that for uh, Asian uh, young people coming out to their Asian parents, to their grandparents is fraught for them. Uh, and they may stay closeted uh, and they may have many reasons for that. As a sex positive provider, we want to honor what they are experiencing, empathize with it, but we're not going to push it. We're not going to say, you know, you really should be out. Uh, that's, that's not uh, part of being, that's not for us to decide. We don't want to be paternalistic or maternal, maternalistic, for example. And then I think the third, key, the, the, another point under this key is um, helping uh, sexual and gender minority clients with advocacy and self-advocacy. For example, uh, I've worked with many, uh, say, uh, undergrad students, graduate students who are facing some kind of discrimination or, you know, something, something in regard to their uh, sexual um, uh, identity. Um, or they're afraid that they're going to be discriminated against and you know, trying to help them identify uh, the LGBTQ center at their uh, school or an ombudsman or a club or something where they can connect with others and start to learn who are, um, who are the sex positive people on their campus that they can go to for help. Key number four, examine one's own biases. Hey, you know what? I have biases. <laughs> I do. I, I, I keep learning things and I think, hmm, that's interesting. I don't know too much about that. Uh, sometimes I'm even uncomfortable, but I want to uh, talk to people about it. I want to do some reading. I want to look at articles and see what they say. I want to have an understanding and to uh, not, not be reactive uh, when new things come to my own attention. Um, it also means reflecting on your own sexual development, your identity and relationships. And I'll just use myself again. You know, I was raised uh, as a time when you know, monogamy was about the only choice. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm personally, I'm fine with being monogamous. I've been monogamous for many years, but, you know, many people have come into my practice in the past who identified as being polyamorous. And I had to kind of check my ideas about that, my biases, um, understand it, uh, talk with, uh, other people and so on and so forth. Um, and then the, the last thing on this slide is to consider taking a SAR. A SAR it stands for uh, Sexual Attitude Reassessment. Um, and you, you, it's required if you're going to become ASEC certified. ASEC is the American Association of Sexuality Educators, Counselors, and Therapists. And there are many requirements. I'm not going to go into them, but you can go to the ASEC website and learn more uh, or go to my website. Um, but the sexual attitude reassessment, you watch uh, a lot of media. Some of it is sexually explicit, some not, about different sexual behaviors, uh, orientations, uh, so on and so forth. And you're checking in with your reaction or your response to that and um, discussing it openly with other people who are also attending the SAR. And it's a, it's a, it's a really fascinating experience. Uh, it, so for some people, it really is I don't know if I would go so far as saying life-changing, but definitely attitude-changing. Number five, become a role model for others. So as you develop a sex-positive outlook that depathologizes behavior and expression that's different from your own, you set yourself up as being a role model for other providers as well as people who come into your practice to show them that uh, to be non-judgmental. I, I, for me, 
when a, a client told me about something that they were doing, maybe they were wearing clothing of the opposite gender. So what we used to call cross-dressing, you know, somebody would come in and tell me about that or some article of clothing that they like to wear. Uh, and I would be, you know, accepting of them very often, if not somewhere in the middle at the end of our our work together, they would say the thing that was most helpful to them was that I was non-judgmental. So that positive outlook was so helpful to that person. Um, you want to learn how to ask and talk about sexuality with clients. Hopefully, if you've not read my book, hopefully you will read my book. It gives you so much information about how to talk to clients about all kinds of things. You also, by talking about sex, you are uh, showing clients how to talk about sex as an adult. Um, as one mentor said, you know, where do we learn to talk about sex? We learn in the locker room, on the playground, at a, you know, the girls' night out, at a bar, or something like that. We don't really learn how to sit down and just have a conversation about something that's so central to who we are. Um, and next, you want to advocate for safer and consensual sex. You know, I've had clients who, uh, you know, they, they're, I don't know, they're on Tinder or something like that. I don't tell them not to be on Tinder. That's not my place. But I do check in with them and say, you know, I just want to uh, check in on that and make sure that you are, you know, practicing safer sex and using a condom and, you know, uh, maybe asking partner to get tested at certain intervals or before you become initially become sexually active and so on. Uh, and then I keep saying this over and over, but to embrace the sex positivity, avoid pathologizing, pathologizing people and behaviors. Uh, so many things are okay as long as it does not cause the person to have distress. So to summarize, I do believe that every provider can become more sex positive. I think it's important to keep your sex education current. If you have the first edition of the book, uh, trust me, the third edition is much different because there's so much more knowledge uh, just in terms of research, say, on um, sexuality and uh, Black people or sexuality and people who identify, you know, men who have sex with men, for example, and so on. Uh, you want to reflect on your own biases, check them out. You know, we all have them, no shame here. Uh, just reflect on what they are and see if uh, you need to have an, an attitude adjustment. You want to create an affirming practice by making everyone feel welcome in your office, uh, no matter what their orientation, their gender, their race, their religion, their culture, everyone should be welcome in your practice. Uh, and even if you're not a, a sex therapist, you know, you're going to have people who come into your practice who maybe have a kid who's come out as transgender, or maybe uh, another family member has come out as gay. You need to know what the issues are uh, that, that not that that person may be facing, but that, that the client may be grappling with and uh, be able to be affirming to them. Uh, and uh, you want to talk to your clients about sex. Don't avoid it. I know people sometimes say, I don't know how to start. Just start. Just get permission. Say, you know, there's, and then normalize it. There's something that I talk to all of my clients about, and that's about their sexual health. Is there anything that you would like to share with me in that regard? And people will, some people will say no, and others will say, yeah, well, yes, as a matter of fact, I'm so glad that you asked. And somebody else might say, you know, I, I'm not sure I want to talk about that. And that's okay. They don't have to talk about it, but you'd be surprised how often maybe later on they say, you know, you asked me about sex. They may bring it up. So always bring it up. Last but not least, seek consultation. If you don't know how to work with a particular population or you don't understand a particular behavior, find someone who knows about it so that you can uh, help the person in an appropriate way. So that is are the five keys to becoming a sex positive provider. And now we'll have questions. 
but I know we also want to mention, uh, I think, uh, Rhonda or yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Stephanie. That was fabulous. It was a great presentation, as we all knew it would be. And we want to underscore here that the book is now available, the new edition of what every mental health professional needs to know about sex. Uh, you can purchase the book with a 25% discount uh, using the code that you see here on the screen. If you are interested in adopting this book for a course, you can follow the link that you see there to find your sales rep. Uh, and then, uh, Stephanie, can you move to the next slide? Yeah. And you can also contact me once again, for those of you who came in a, a little bit late. My name is Rhonda Dearborn. I am the senior editor for uh, counseling and uh, therapy here at Springer Publishing Company. And if you have questions about the book or questions about who your sales rep is, please contact me at rdearborn at springerpub.com. And... Lee, who's going to be post, uh, answer, asking some of the questions on your behalf to Dr. Bueller, he is our director of sales and uh, in new business development management. And if you have interest in the book for continuing education or for your society or for any group, uh, you can contact Lee at that email address you see right there, lmontville at springerpub.com. Lee, did you want to say something? Uh, well, thanks very much, Stephanie. That was amazing. And we've received a lot of questions. So I'm excited to ask you the questions. Shoot. <laughs> cool. Yeah. One, just one thing I wanted to yep. say um, is that a lot of folks had asked about um, CEs. There's no CEs with this presentation, but... Um, as Gina said in the chat, Gina Martinez is our uh, colleague on the marketing side. We don't offer CEs, but we can send a certificate of attendance. Um, if you have already requested one in the chat, uh, you can go ahead. She's going to go ahead and follow up with you. Um, but if you do want a... Um, if you have not said so already that you would like to get a certificate of attendance, you can reach out to Gina... Uh, or myself. Uh, Gina, what is your email address for, for the folks on? Chat. So it's G Martinez at springerpub.com. Thank you, Gina. Okay. Yeah. Uh, with that, turning it back okay. over to Lee for questions. Great. Uh, one additional thing is if anybody is interested in ordering bulk quantities, like 10 copies, 20 copies, 50 copies, please feel free to reach out to me as well. Um, so, Stephanie, the first question we have from Tina is, my colleague and I are designing a sexual health education counseling program at a local college for our doctoral project. We are using the USPSTF recommendations published in 2020, supporting that education slash counseling are effective in decreasing STIs. We are designing a curriculum to be delivered in a two-hour session to college-aged individuals. Do you have any recommendations or key points we should definitely incorporate in our counseling program? Well, that's that. That's a great question. Um, I I think I mean it's this is a really important topic. Uh, we know that STI rates, say, gonorrhea, for example, are skyrocketing. So it's very important. Uh, one thing that I would say, I know from my clinical experience, especially as somebody who worked in a um, medical setting, that many people don't know how to talk about having an STI, for example, herpes, which is really kind of epidemic like or endemic, I think, um, uh, such a common thing, but people are super embarrassed talking about it, bringing it up. And I think that contributes to spread. And uh, so that would be something that I would include in my training. Great, thanks very much. Um, another question was, do you bring up sex and therapy or should it be led by the client? Now that's a, that, that is a good question. It's one I've heard a lot. I think 
uh, what the research says is that even if the client does want to talk about sex, they really prefer that the therapist or the provider bring it up because then they know that it's safe to talk about. So the onus is really on the, on the provider to make it feel safe, uh, to let the client know that it's not weird to talk about in your office. Great. Uh, Latesha asked, what if the client is a minor and they want to talk about sex? <laughs> That's a good question. I mean, I did work with um, teens at one time. Uh, you know, it's fine to talk to them about sex, but I think, uh, you know, uh, remembering way back when I did work with teens, it would be talking to them about the fact that if they were doing something that was unsafe, then uh, we might need to talk to mom and dad about, uh, or mom or dad, about uh, what is going on. Um, uh, and uh, that, that's kind of where I would leave that. But, it, you know, if they have questions about their bodies changing or um, certain kinds of sexual behavior like masturbation, I would certainly talk to them about it. Great. The next question is from Soren. I work as a physical therapist and routinely get questions about how to accommodate pain or physical disability within a sexual relationship. I have two main questions. One, are there any resources to help me address sexuality with physical disability and pain? And two, how do I find mental health providers who address sex or are sex positive providers? Cool. <laughs> I'm so glad that you're here. Um, my office uh, when I was at the hospital was in a pelvic floor physical therapy setting. So um, uh, I, I think for physical therapists, there's, I don't, I don't know if this is what you're asking. Uh, there's specialized training in uh, uh, pelvic floor uh, physical therapy. Um, as for sexuality and disabilities, there is a resource called Pleasure Able, pleasure, the word pleasure, dash able. Look for that uh, online. That is a wonderful resource for you. And um, I do write about uh, sexuality and uh, chronic illness in my book, uh, and that can be helpful to you as well. And then, oh, finding a mental health provider, uh, ASECT, uh, double A, S like Sam, E, C, T, E, C like cat, T, ASECT, is a place where you can find somebody. You can also look on um, STAR, Sex, uh, uh, Society for Sex Therapy and Research. And another place is ISWISH, uh, which is I, double S like Sam, W, S like Sam, H. Perfect. The next question was, when working with minor clients, how do you incorporate sex positivity, especially if it goes against their parents' culture or religion? I think this comes up with adults as well. I think, you know, you, you can just do a compare and contrast. You can say, well, what is it that you believe about sex and sexuality? And then what is it that your parents believe about that? And how do you feel about those differences? And uh, what is it that you want to do about them? You know, there, there are going to be differences. Um, you know, it, that that's, I mean, we could spend a day. <laughs> we really could. We could spend a day just talking about that. Um, I don't treat, I haven't treated minors in my practice in a very long time, but I know that comes up for uh, young adults. And so it really is talking about those differences and, and what they believe. Mm -hmm. Great. Ashley asks an important question Rhonda had mentioned before regarding adoptions. Ashley asks, what would you say this book offers that other textbooks may not? I'm teaching the sexuality and counseling course this spring for masters in counseling students. And I'm considering adopting this text. Oh, okay. Well, uh, having looked at most of the other, I think all of the other texts to see what's in them, 
I would say uh, that this is written, it's very, uh, I, I have a master's degree in writing from USC. Uh, and I don't put my MPW, it's enough letters already, but I do have a master's degree in writing. So I, I think that I've worked really hard to make this topic accessible and to bring down the anxiety about uh, thinking about and talking about sexuality. So that would be one thing. The other thing is I wrote the book that I wanted to have when I started learning sex therapy. I found it confusing to have chapters written by a lot of different people. And I was trying to sort of hang my or get my head around what is it exactly that I'm doing. And so there's a framework in there, the ecosystemic framework, uh, and that I think is also especially helpful if you're talking about uh, marriage and family therapists, uh, you know, to have that systemic framework for them to start talking, thinking about and talking about sexuality. Great. We have a couple more questions. Shannon asks, I would like to know how to educate a coworker on inclusivity. Is that covered in the book? Yes, it is. I do write about that. Um, I think, I, honestly, I give them a copy of the book. I have information uh, woven throughout every chapter, and then there's a lengthy chapter about uh, work being affirming with LGBTQ plus clients. So um, that would be one recommendation. Uh, the other is to maybe have them going to uh, different websites like uh, GLAAD, for example, G-L-A-A-D like dog, uh, and start uh, becoming informed about the issues that uh, sexual and gender minority people face. Great. Um, we have another question, which is asking or tips for asking about pronouns, gender identity, sexual orientation without possibly insulting the client, assuming that you don't have a written intake form that the client fills out themselves asking these questions. I would have a written intake form. I would, I would have a written intake form. Um, and, you know, with something about, you know, what are your pronouns uh, and uh, how do you identify in terms of orientation and gender, I think that uh, takes away from some of the awkwardness. Um, if somebody doesn't like seeing those questions on an intake because they are, um, you know, they have homophobia or transphobia, well, they'll just skip over them. Uh, I doubt that they would bring it up. So I would have it, I would have it, I would recommend having it on the intake form. However, that being said, if you, for whatever reason, you don't have an intake form, you could say something like, I, you know, I, I identify, I'll just use myself, I identify as a, a heterosexual cisgender female, and I use the pronouns her, hers. So I'm wondering if you wouldn't mind uh, telling me about your, I, you know, how you would like to be um, addressed, your pronouns, and then let them tell you what else they want about their identity. Great. And a lot of people today include um, those in their signatures, in their emails. Yes, they do. Well. Yes. So, mm -hmm. um, actually, we have a couple more questions that came in. Sexuality and chronic illness. Um, is there, are there any specific resources I can share with my clients who suffer from chronic illness? Yeah, so I have a colleague named Ann Katz, K-A-T-Z. <laughs> Uh, and she's written several books about sexuality and cancer. Uh, you know, so there's one for about sexuality, cancer, and young adults. There's one on uh, uh, sexual health and women, one about sexual health and men. I think those are really great resources. Elizabeth asks, asks, I've spoken at some special needs schools and I get asked by the parents about sexuality for their young adult children. Does your book address sexuality and developmental disabilities? You know, it really does not in depth. Uh, and I think I'm, I'm sighing because I know, I know this is a big issue. 
Um, and actually my daughter, Annika, is going to school right now to become a counselor because that's the work that she wants to do. So I'm very aware of that. I, I did not treat developmentally disabled people in my uh, practice. I did treat neurodivergent, so people on the spectrum, but not uh, developmentally disabled. Um, the, the main thing is, um, I think, a couple of main things. One is to have uh, appropriate educational resources. That means having access to books that explain things about the body and hormones and what's going on, the kinds of things that a, a, a teenager might read, uh, but written. I think there are specialized uh, resources. Um, you know, you can email, uh, you can email uh, maybe Rhonda and, and ask and she will forward your email to me and I will find out for you. So educational resources, lots of talk around consent, what's consensual, uh, talking about sexual boundaries. I think that's important as well. And helping parents not become upset or uh, judgmental or shaming if the uh, person displays behaviors like masturbating in an inappropriate place, you know, knowing how to set boundaries on certain behaviors. So that's my knowledge. And uh, I hope that's helpful to you. Great. Thanks, Ron. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, now, Rhonda would like to um, wrap things up with you. Rhonda? Yeah. So thanks, everyone. We really appreciate it again. Uh, again, for those of you who came on uh, during the middle or later, this is being recorded. It will be disseminated along with the presentation deck uh, via email in about a week to 10 days. Uh, Stephanie, can you go back one slide? Because people Absolutely. were asking about yes, the yes. Yes. code. So this is the discount code. If you want to purchase the new edition of what every mental health professional needs know to know about sex, it does come with digital access to the book. A repurchase of the book has digital access with the book. Um, and I just wanted to ask on a few folks' behalf, again, uh, Stephanie, people asked about ASECT. Can you give them that information about ASECT again? Yes, it's uh, American Association for Sexuality Educators, Counselors, and Therapists. So it's double A, S like Sam, E, C like cat, T like Tom, dot org. And that's where you can find more, out more <clears throat> about uh, sex therapy and sexuality counseling certification, also sex educator certification, if that interests you. Yeah. And I just also with the person who asked about, hey, why should I use your book? There's other books out there and so on. I just wanted to talk a little bit about and maybe, you know, Stephanie might not want to blow her own horn, but uh, this book has been used in a lot of programs. It initially was written for professionals, for people to use in their practice, but it became such a hit in the classroom used in graduate and undergraduate programs and counseling and other behavioral sciences because it is easy to read. It is straightforward. It is not difficult and verbose and overly uh, wordy. And that's one of the things that really people love about Dr. Bueller's book. I do also want to talk about the fact that it does cover sexuality across the lifespan. It has a feature called Step Into My Office that has vignettes that offer a glimpse into everyday sex therapy practice, provides activities for readers to reinforce information, including takeaway points, um, templates, and tools. <clears throat> there are also instructor resources. There's an instructor's manual, PowerPoint presentation, and a lot of other great stuff. So I just wanted to plug a, a couple of other things about the book. Thank um, you. <laughs> Yeah, that being said, we're going to wrap up. We really appreciate all of your time. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Stephanie, Dr. Bueller. Thank you so much. Thanks to Lee. Thanks to Gina and all of our internal folks. And everyone have a great afternoon.